Tonight, homeless children in the Cleveland area reveal unbelievable stories of how they survive. I'm Jenny Dean. News Channel 5 at 11 is next. News Channel 5 is brought to you by University Hospitals of Cleveland, Cleveland's premier medical center. Now, from Ohio's most watched news team, this is News Channel 5 at 11. It's another long night for the jury in the trial of Audrey Iacona. A second day of deliberating fails to produce a verdict. The jury remains sequestered tonight, but the judge in the case joins us live from his courtroom where it all happened. Okay. The life, the freedom, and the future of Audrey Iacona is now squarely in the hands of the jury. Will they find this 17-year-old guilty of killing her newborn? Or will Audrey be allowed to go on with her life? It's a case that has captured the city of Medina, causing residents to react with strong emotions. News Channel 5's Joe Paganakis is live in our newsroom. Joe, is there any indication the jury's even close to a verdict? No, not really, Lee. In fact, it appears the jury of nine men and three women are far apart here. They were supposed to deliberate until 9 tonight. Instead, they called it quits at just after 6 o'clock. In the meantime, most Medina residents can't wait for the media spotlight to leave. In Medina, the effects of the Audrey Iacona trial can be seen everywhere, and it's on the minds of just about everyone who walks or drives by the Medina County Courthouse. Everyone that walks in my shop is talking about it. So. When I go by the courthouse, I pray. I, you know, I pray for all the people that are involved and um, maybe what pain they'll be going through. I think it's a very sad situation. I think it should have been left in juvenile court. Many Medina residents say they wouldn't want to be on the jury of nine men and three women, considering whether Audrey Iacona is guilty of murder, two separate counts of involuntary manslaughter, two counts of child endangering, and a count of abusing a corpse. Most Medina residents say they just want the trial to be over. This is something that has to be dealt with and is going to court and it happens to be going to court in this area. Now it's happening in Medina, it's happening all over and it's, people are probably wondering, you know, what's going on? Why are all these scandals all of a sudden happening now? It's kind of ghoulish for everybody to be so interested in it. And we've said this from the beginning, if convicted of murder, Audrey Iacona would face 15 years to life in prison. Lead jury deliberations continue tomorrow morning. Our coverage continues tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. with Good Morning Cleveland. Sounds like the residents there feel a bit like their city's under siege, Joe. There's no question about that, Lee. Thanks a lot. Okay. Ted? It is not at all an understatement to suggest that this court case has captured the attention of the nation. It has all the elements. And it has certainly captured the imagination of just about everybody in this region. So much so that there are very few areas left to turn to for expert opinion that haven't already been exhausted. Except one. Tonight we have managed to come up live with one additional resource in this case, the presiding judge, no less. I would like to introduce you right now to the Medina County Common Pleas Court Judge James Kimbler. Judge Kimbler, first of all, welcome. Well, uh, thank you. What are we to read into the fact that the jury is not yet to the point of reaching a verdict in this case? Might they be deadlocked? I don't think so, uh, Mr. Henry. I think they're doing their job. They're being very conscientious. This has been a very hardworking jury. Uh, during the trial, they were allowed to take notes, and I watched, and they took a lot of notes. And they have about 73 exhibits to go over. So I, I don't think we're near a deadlock jury yet. Didn't I hear you earlier in the day saying that they would be probably uh, with a verdict by this evening? <laughs> yeah, and that just goes to show you that I'm the last person in the world that knows what juries are going to do. Uh, but I do believe that we will get a verdict in this case. I thought we would get a verdict this afternoon, and as you can see, uh, I was wrong. A couple of quick questions here, Judge. Courts these days seem to be trying more and more teenagers as adults. In your estimation, when does a youngster cross that very arbitrary line anymore between being treated as a juvenile or an adult? Well, the uh, Ohio General Assembly has said that at 15 and above, you can be tried as an adult. And if you commit the crime of murder after 15, you have to be tried as an adult. The juvenile court doesn't have a choice. So the General Assembly has made that choice for us. Judge, you've presided over more than 200 jury trials, from what I have been told. So you must be able to uh, read juries fairly well. How does this one stack up? I think this has been probably the most intense trial I've ever been involved with. Uh, it's intense for the Iacona family and, and for uh, Audrey Iacona and the prosecutors, but it's, it's also intense for the jury. And I think this is just a very hardworking jury trying to do their job, and I, I think they're going to do their job. Finally, Judge, forgive me here. I want to frame this last question to you as carefully and as delicately as I can, and I certainly mean no disrespect by asking you this. Isn't it awfully unusual, and is it altogether right 
for you to be speaking to the media about this sensitive case while it's still a living, breathing court matter? That's an interesting uh, uh, question you bring up, and you're the first person to ask me that. Actually, the Supreme Court just recently revised the rules to allow judges to make uh, comments, provided those comments do not uh, impact on the, on the uh, fairness of the trial. In this case, since the jury is sequestered, cannot hear what I'm saying, and cannot read the paper or hear a news broadcast, uh, I think it's appropriate to do this. If the jury was not sequestered, I would not be appearing on your program tonight. You've made yourself available to media all day long on this matter for which I'm grateful, but for which I'm also puzzled until you just clarified it right there. Judge Kimler, thank you very much for joining us sure, from Medina tonight. And in other news, a Cleveland doctor is behind bars tonight, charged with more than 200 counts of drug trafficking. Dr. George Smirnoff is accused of turning patients into drug addicts and then feeding their habits for a number of years. Smirnoff denies the charges and says investigators are confusing drug addiction with pain management. Is the doctor to blame when someone abuses his medications? Does that mean that patients who take it properly should not be allowed to have it? And how can a doctor tell when someone comes in here and lies to him? We have no way to measure pain. This doctor, basic practice was to addict his patients and then hide behind his medical practice and say that he was treating them in a pain management setting. If convicted, Smirnoff faces a maximum of 15 years to life in prison. Hey, another hat's just been thrown into the ring to fill the seat being vacated by retiring Congressman Lou Stokes. State Senator Jeffrey Johnson, this man, announced this afternoon he is now running for the 11th congressional seat. Johnson says he's been preparing for this race for a long time. He will run as a Democrat along with prosecutor Stephanie Tubbs-Jones. And coming up on News Channel 5 at 11. of homeless children live in our area. Tonight, they show us personally how they survive. A lot of people have homes and it's like we don't. I'm Jenny Dean with this special assignment. An armed robber keeps getting caught on videotape, but he hasn't been caught by police. I'm Ed Gallick and you'll see him in an exclusive Crime Stoppers report. Coming up in commentary, is golf a sport or a mind-altering compulsion? I'm Matt Underwood in Winter Haven, Florida. Coming up, it's my first installment of the Spring Training Notebook, later in sports. Police call him the Gentleman Bandit. Ed Gallick has an exclusive Crime Stoppers report with the guy in the action. It doesn't look much like a holdup, but police say the guy pocketing the cash has robbed about a dozen convenience stores in Cleveland and 10 suburbs. The man came in this door right here. He then handed me a note. It said, put your hands up. So I was like, are you serious? Crime Stoppers is serious, serious about catching this guy. He's shown a gun, although he's polite. He said, thank you. I said, it'll be OK. God bless you. And I start crying. And he said, thank you. He's refined his act to a point where he's got everything written on a note, the instructions for the cashier to keep her hands where he can see him. Police say in some ways this guy is very cautious. He never hits when a store is busy like this one is now and he always has a getaway car parked around another building or in an alley. Watch him again. Help police find him and you could get a reward up to two thousand dollars from Crime Stoppers plus another reward like that from BP. Call 252-7463. You don't have to give your name. Like I was really upset and nervous after he left, and I was really, you know, shaking and stuff. He shouldn't do that to nobody. Police are afraid eventually somebody's going to get hurt. Ed Gallick, News Channel 5. Police believe the suspect is robbing these places because of a drug habit. The Professional Golfers Association still plans to appeal the ruling in the Casey Martin trial. You may recall a judge ruled Wednesday to allow golfer Casey Martin to use a cart in tournament play. Martin has a rare circulatory disorder which makes it painful for him to walk. The PGA commissioner says Martin will likely play in a tour event this year and probably will have at least two years without legal interference to ride on the tour. Complaints that the Martin ruling will ruin the sport of golf have Dick Fagler confused. Malik, golf isn't a sport, is it? It's some kind of compulsion or addiction or personality disorder, isn't it? In sports, the ball keeps moving around and people try to catch it or throw it or hit it. In golf, you wait until the ball is lying there, dead as a doornail, and rigor mortis has set in, and then you poke it with a stick. 
In sports, people run and jump a lot. There's a sense of urgency. But condemned men walk to the electric chair faster than professional golfers walk from hole to hole on television. In sports, the announcers get excited and yell. Golf announcers transmit their alleged thrills in mumbles and whispers. Now Mr. Henry is addressing the ball. Hello, ball, he says. The ball says nothing. You can hear more exuberance in the front parlor of McGorry's funeral hall. Golf is pool with deeper pockets. I can't think of anything about golf that Casey Martin's appearance in a golf cart will ruin. He is not a midget showing up with a stepladder and demanding to be let into the NBA. He is not a slowpoke demanding to rollerblade in an Olympic 100-yard dash. All he asks is an equal chance to hit a dead ball with a stick and may the best man win. There's even a golf term for that. I think it's called the fairway. It's a world most of us have never seen. These local homeless children take us behind the scenes and into the streets. I'm Jenny Dean with tonight's special assignment. Well, it's not going to be golf weather for the next couple of days. Back to February, temperatures in the 30s, a few snow flurries, but next week it warms up again, and we'll check that in just a few minutes. Almost got to look like February a little bit today on uh, the east side and all over town for that matter, huh? Yeah, it's kind of chilly. No golf weather. Do you think golf is a personality disorder? <laughs> <laughs> she asks the golfer. I, th I think that it has something to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Your personality becomes disordered after you've played right. it for a while. That's, that's for sure. Okay. It has a definite effect on it. <laughs> All right, let's find out now whether or not we will have any golf weather throughout northern Ohio for the next few days. And uh, all is quiet around the state right now, so we will check what we had today. 47 was our high, 33 our low. The average high for this date is 34. The average low is 18. Last year, up to 31 and down to 18. Record high was 65. Doesn't that sound nice? Set back in 1984. Record low, nine below, set in 1917. We've had a little bit of snow, two one-hundredths of an inch, uh, and that, or two-tenths of an inch, I sh should say, for snow. And that was since midnight last night. And that's the total for the month, year-to-date, 24.5. We are well below normal. In Cleveland now, it's 34. Toledo 33, Findlay 34, down in Mansfield 32, 30s all over the place. Lake temperatures still hanging in there at 36 degrees. At the airport, it's 34. Humidity is 76%. The barometer, 30.01 inches. That's rising a little bit. Winds are out of the west at 8 miles an hour. And there we have it once again for our snow, two-tenths of an inch since uh, midnight last night. And now, here's what's happening. Nothing much. Kind of a quiet night tonight, really. Here's a precipitation that affected us today in the form of a little bit of uh, rain and a little bit of snow. It's all changed to pretty much rain. It's all moving away off the uh, northeast coast, as you can see here. And over the next 24 hours, a little disturbance is dropping down. That'll give us cloudy skies, a chance of a few scattered snow flurries tomorrow and uh, on into Saturday. But uh, we're not looking for any accumulation. In the meantime, out west, some uh, snow continues to fall. Not showing it right now, but there's another system coming into California. They're expecting more rain on the weekend out there, thanks to El Nino again. Okay, our forecast now looks like this. For tonight, mostly cloudy, a few flurries. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 with a low of 26. Sunrise time, 726. At 9 o'clock and throughout uh, the day tomorrow, we will have a chance of flurries. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10. Temperature will rise to 35. That'll be it tomorrow. Sunset time, one minute before 6 o'clock. And the five-day forecast. A little February like for a couple of days for tomorrow, 35, and on Saturday, 38 degrees with a chance of a flurry. Then Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, cloudy skies warming up, chance of a few showers by Monday and Tuesday, and temperatures getting up to near 50 degrees once again. That's just incredible. I want to talk about Mark Johnson for just a minute. I want to remind you about a, a new partnership. The WDOK morning team and News Channel 5 meteorologist Mark Johnson have joined forces. And Mark joins Trapper Jack and his crew with up to the minute weather forecasts. And you can also catch uh, Mark's forecasts on News Channel 5 this morning and Good Morning Cleveland starting at 5.30 a.m. So catch them here live. And then as you're driving to work, listen to him on the radio. He's going to become the most popular weather fella in the country next to you someday. Well, he certainly He's is. going to be everywhere. Yes. He'll never quite catch up with you, though. Uh, he will. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. Coming up next on News Channel 5 at 11 o'clock. From the streets to the shelters, these local homeless children tell personal stories that are difficult to believe. I'm Jenny Dean with this special assignment coming up next. 
It's an issue that tugs at the heart. There are over 10,000 homeless children right here in Northeast Ohio. 10,000. And tonight we give you a glimpse of how these youngsters survive. News Channel 5's Jenny Dean takes us now into the never before seen world of some local homeless kids. Ted, we are going to take you into that world, but only because the kids were brave enough to let us in. What's more, they agreed to use camcorders to show us personally how they survive. As you watch this and maybe think back to your own childhood, maybe your room and your old bed, you might find it hard to believe the lives of these homeless children in tonight's special assignment. Try to think of this empty window as a symbol of all the children out there who have no window to call their own. It feels painful. Very, very, so much very painful. To know that you're in a homeless shelter and your parents can't provide. A lot of people have homes and it's like we don't. Did you tell anybody that you live in a homeless shelter? Never. Why not? I'm embarrassed. So I think they might make fun of me or something or something like that or just criticize me because I'm homeless or just judge me because I'm homeless. And that's what made this teenager afraid to show you his face. The younger children were not so afraid, like this 10-year-old girl. My name is Coral, and really, my best outfit is probably what I've got on. My name is Lace. I want people to know that I live in the house so they don't laugh that I live in the shelter. My name is Shayna. Just because I'm homeless, I'm not a different person. Shayna blames her homelessness on her mom, who she says one day just couldn't pay the rent. No rent money is a common reality for thousands of Ohio kids in shelters and on the streets. I think they, they think, you know, because we're poor, we don't have anything, or because we're poor, we never had anything, or we never will. They agreed to show us what they do have in a very personal way, by using borrowed camcorders to record their lives in a shelter. During the day, there's the constant noise of homeless families. At night, it's the tight space of sleeping quarters. This is pretty much where I live. Here's the bathroom. Everybody rushes in the morning to brush their teeth and everything. Sometimes a lot of people can't get in here. This 14-year-old then takes us down the hall to his room and his two sleeping brothers. That's one of my brothers, Hurricane, and there's the other tornado. And then something you might not expect of a homeless teen. He takes us to his books because this is a child who maintains a 3.0 grade point average and wrestles on the varsity wrestling team. A lot of homeless people have a lot of pride in themselves. They think highly of others. All they pretty much want to do is just get another house. There. He shows us the temporary house of his best friend at the shelter. Where my best friend lives in. And this is my room. And this. This is my artwork. This is important to me. His homeless friend is an artist who sits in a local library and sketches away his fears of homelessness and all that it comes with, including a new school that he thinks is dangerous. Okay, this is it, school. School that I hate. Hate it because people are bad influence here and they never even listen to what even the teachers say and violence, cursing and other things here. I just don't like it for any reason. And I have to go here tomorrow and every day until I get out of the shelter. He doesn't like the school that comes with the shelter. The others don't like the image of living in a shelter. So they put down their cameras to tell us the disturbing view they think you have of them. I just want them thinking of us as human beings, not like stupid, dirty people. I'm nice. I don't care who don't think I'm nice, well, I think I'm nice. Even if you don't have that much money, you're still a good person inside. And sometimes when I see outside and I have some change in my pocket, I give the, the people who hold out cups some, some change so they can get something to eat. Well, I hope they wouldn't think I was poor and I was mean and everything, just didn't care about anybody. And I hope they would think of me as myself. This is the view the children here have of their shelter home. In fact, one of the children here is shooting the video you see right now. But the kids here say they are grateful for these four walls, but it's still not the same as having their own home. There's certain privileges 
that you can't do like the things that you would do at home. But it's not the greatest to be homeless. It's better to have your own home, but at least we have a roof over our head. And if you think kids without homes are a rarity, look at the numbers. Over 8,000 homeless children in Cuyahoga County alone and several thousand more in surrounding counties, according to estimates. What bothers you most about the fact you don't have a home? That I might never get one again. I wish that I had a home on my own, and each day we get closer and closer and, more, and a little bit more money. You look forward to the day you have a house, don't you? Mm -hmm. I hope it's tomorrow. Well, he hoped for a new home by tomorrow, and you know what? He got it. He, his brothers, and mom found a house and if you are wondering how homeless kids survive out there, some say that funds are tighter than ever for poor kids. But there are three shelters just for children in Cleveland, as well as several programs to help them, like the Cleveland Public Schools Project Act, which helps provide education to homeless kids. Finally, I have to say our thanks to the two shelters that opened their doors for this story, Zelma George and Harbor Light Salvation Army. Thanks so much. Jenny, you've given us a unique insight into the plight of the homeless, and I'll bet you over the years... Lee, we've done hundreds of stories on homeless adults and homeless youngsters, and I've never quite seen it this way before. I didn't know there were 10,000 youngsters in the two or three counties in northeastern Ohio here. Thank you, Jenny. Coming up, it was day six at the Winter Olympics in Nagano. Matt Gafari joins us with a complete wrap of the day's events. Plus, the Cavaliers ended their rock slide against the Raptors up in Toronto. Thomas Forrester has a story coming up in sports. It was day one of spring training for the Indians. And that lucky dog, Matt Underwood, is down there right now in Winter Haven with some information from inside the dugout. Matt? Well, Ted and Lee, it was a very successful first day of spring training for the Indians here in Winter Haven, Florida. And as we check out my spring training notebook, we see that a number of players have already reported to camp. Pitchers Mike Jackson, Chad OJ, Ben McDonald, Steve Carsey, Paul Shuey, Bartolo Colon, all reporting today. Also already in camp, Jim Tomey, Jeff Branson, Jeff Manto, and a number of other players. Also Ron Karkovice, one of the spring training invitees for the backup catcher position. Jim Tomey told me a couple of interesting things. During the offseason, Jim took part in a hunting show for the Nashville Network near his hometown in Peoria, Illinois. He joined fellow major leaguers Charlie O'Brien, Bill Spires, and Alex Gonzalez for some fun in the woods. Jim Tomey also told me that he is finally and officially going to get married at the end of the 1998 baseball season. He will marry his fiancée, Andrea Passioni. The official date is coming up in November. And also, Jim told me that he has never played with Enrique Wilson before. Enrique is the top candidate to fill the tribe's void at second base, but he's never even taken a throw from Enrique because last year when Wilson was called up from Buffalo, he contacted the chicken pox and had to be quarantined. So, Tommy will finally get his first opportunity to play with Wilson here at spring training. But that's what spring training is for. That's a look at our first edition of the spring training notebook. Now let's go back to Thomas Forrester to see how the Cavaliers did tonight against Toronto. Thomas? Thanks, Matt. The Raptors have won 11 games all season. One of those were against the Cavaliers last month at the gun. Tonight, it was payback time in Toronto. In the first, Cavs come out running. Brevin Knight dishes the Wesley Person. Over to Sean Kemp, he finishes with the jam. In the third, Cavs go on 11-0 run thanks to this guy, Person, and his outside shot. He finishes with 28 points on the night as the Cavs walk away with a 103-94 win over the Raptors. One other score, CSU beat up Wright State 71-67 today. It was day six of the Winter Olympics in Nagano. Joining us now with a complete wrap-up, that is, is silver medalist Matt Gaffari. Matt, thanks, you Thomas. Enjoy. The biggest news today was when the International Olympic Committee returned the gold medal to Canada. The reason, no legal precedent for marijuana. American snowboarders Shannon Dunn and Ross Powers each historic Olympic bronze medal in the first ever women's and men's half pipe event. That brings the medal counts for the U.S. up to four. Todd Eldridge escaped a fantastic short program and currently in third place going to tomorrow's long program. In the downhill event, the gold medal favorites from Austria crashed at 80 miles per hour and walked away. But the, this guy, the Italian, was not so lucky. He had to be taken away by helicopter. Biron Dali of Norway won his sixth Olympic in gold medal in cross-country steam. This is a new Winter Olympics record for anybody. He credits 
this to artificial high altitude living and low altitude training to his success. Thomas. Okay, Matt, thanks a lot. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank okay. you. All right. Thanks, Matt. We'll be right back. We're out of time. We thank you for joining us tonight. Have a nice evening, everyone. We'll see you again tomorrow. Nightline is next. Until then, good night. Good night.